Our digital producer, Malika Bilal, is furiously collecting all your live feedback so we can feature it on the show. Tweet her using the hashtag AJStream. Malika, this is a controversial topic. It is. This is one we've been seeing comments on for days now, and it's all been very heated. Now, remember, for those of you at home, tweet us your thoughts on the question, is there room for religion in science? We'll try to bring your, your thoughts into the discussion. Use the hashtag AJStream. One of the things that makes our show unique is, of course, you. It's all about community, and one of the ways you can be a part of it is with Google+. Just add the stream to your circles like these folks did, and you could wind up in the stream. Hi, I'm Shah Saliman. I'm from Singapore. I'm a journalist, and I think social media is where news that matters breaks first. I am in the stream. Science continues to expand our knowledge and resolve many of our unanswered questions about our existence. However, for some, it has also opened the door to skepticism as evolutionary biology veers them away from the belief in a supreme being. One writer is even suggesting that atheists will outnumber those with religious beliefs worldwide by 2038. But current trends in the U.S. are challenging that. Take a look at this. One Gallup poll suggests that more than 9 in 10 Americans still believe in God, with 46 percent accepting creationism. And here's a graph of that. This is the view that God created humans in their present form within the last 10,000 years or so. And of course, this contradicts evolutionists who believe everything began billions of years before. And most controversially, humans and apes share a common ancestor and evolved through natural selection. So it's religion against science. But are the two mutually exclusive? Joining us to discuss this from London is Richard Dawkins, renowned evolutionary biologist and professor at Oxford University. Known for his vehement denunciation of the existence of God and religion, he has become one of the leading advocates of atheism. Professor Dawkins is also the author of The Magic of Reality, How We Know What's Really True. Using child-friendly language, Dawkins gives younger audiences an understanding of evolution and the way in which the natural world works. Professor Dawkins, welcome to the stream. Well, thank you. I like that child-friendly language. That's a good phrase. I'll use it. <laughs> you go right after it and use that language. Speaking of language, yeah. you know, you have pretty much defined the modern atheist movement. You've been called the father of new atheism. You have even been called an atheist fundamentalist. I I'm curious, how do you define yourself? Well, strictly speaking, I'm an agnostic because you can never actually prove the non-existence of anything. But I'm about as close to being an atheist as you can get. I'm an atheist in the same sense as I'm an afarist, an a leprechaunist, an aginist, and so on. You know, it, worldwide, it, there are a lot of studies that show that atheists are held in, in very low regard, often reviled. Why do you think that is? Why do people have such a distaste for atheists? Ignorance, pure ignorance. Uh, by the way, you characterized it as religion against science. It's actually creationism against science because there are many religious people who are perfectly happy with evolution. The Archbishop of Canterbury, the Pope, any self-respecting bishop is very happy with evolution. You quoted the figure of 46% of Americans believing that, the, uh, that humanity, uh, that life indeed, was, was created less than 10,000 years ago. I mean, that is not up for discussion. That, that's simply not true. I mean, the, the scientific evidence is so overwhelming. We absolutely know that life began billions of years ago, and we absolutely know for a fact that humans and chimpanzees are cousins, that humans and monkeys are cousins. So that, that's not really up for grabs. What is up for grabs is the existence of God, which is a different matter entirely. Professor Dawkins, I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. Did you just say that the Pope was an evolutionist? Yes, certainly. Okay. Just wanted to clarify. Let's get our community involved in this right away because, Malika, we've got so many people interested Overloaded in this Overloaded with tweets, we comments are. on our subreddit on reddit.com, and of course our Google Plus Hangout. Before we get to Google Plus, I'd like to read a tweet from one person. We put the question out to our community asking, can atheism be considered a religion? Qasem Rashid tweets back, yes, atheism is a religion. Atheists follow a personal code of life, belief, and morality, and believe blind chance is the creator. Well, with that, I'd like to go straight to Google Plus, where Haroon Mogul is waiting to speak to us. Uh, Haroon is a fellow at the New America Foundation. Haroon, go ahead. I just had a question uh, for Professor Dawkins. Uh, if we talk about religion coexisting with science or not coexisting, aren't we assuming that religion and science are both static and unchanging at some level? 
Well, science, of course, is not uh, static and changing. Science changes all the time uh, as new evidence comes in. That's not to say, however, that there aren't some things that we know to be true. I mean, we know that the world orbits the sun, and Jupiter and Mars and everything orbits the sun. Uh, we know the approximate size of the universe and so on, and we also know that evolution is a fact. So science advances, science changes, and the science of the future is likely to be rather different, but there are certain things that, that we do know to be true. Some religions change, and some religions change for the better. Some religions pride themselves on not changing. They regard it as a virtue not to change. Uh, I'm not qualified to say one way or the other about that, but science certainly does change, uh, and it changes in a progressive way towards an ever closer approximation to the truth. Professor Dawkins, you know, something that people generally say with such authority is, well, it's scientifically proven, scientists say. And, and to follow up kind of on what you were saying, you know, it took 1,400 years before we realized that the Earth was not the center of the universe. Uh, is it possible that you may be correct for your time, but in a decade or a century or 500 years, you're going to be disproven, just as these other great thinkers and scientists were in the last century? Well, yes, I mean, that's... That's kind of what I was saying. Um, it, it, it's true that, that, that until the 14th century, uh, we thought we were at the center of the universe, but now we, we know we're not. Um, so that's not up for grabs. That's, that's, going, that's not going to change. Um, there are certain things that are going to change, and I've said that, and the science of 500 years' time may be very different in all sorts of thrilling and exciting ways, ways that have never been dreamed of, um, not by scientists and certainly not by any theologian. But there are some things that we do know we do know now that the Earth is a sphere, it's not flat. We do know that the Earth orbits the Sun. You can go too far with this thing about um, you can never be sure of anything in science. There are things you can be sure of. And I would add that evolution is one of them. Well, with that, let's go straight back to Twitter. Yusor writes in, religion and science can coexist. The most important thing is respect and tolerance. Uh, let's go to Google Plus now because James has a comment. And James is speaking to us from Kampala in Uganda. Uh, go ahead, James. Okay, Professor Dawkins, mine is a question about uh, religion and uh, poverty and rationality. Now, research suggests that uh, there is a correlation between things like insecurity, poverty, poor standards of living, lack of proper education, lack of proper health care, income inequality and other such social economic indicators vis-a-vis -vis religiosity. So it would seem that for as long as people live in desperate conditions, they will always be susceptible to irrational beliefs um, that promise to address their problems. Now, in a country like Uganda, where I live, looking at these indicators, we do poorly. And this might partly explain why religiosity and other forms of superstition persist. Even when science has come a long way in providing ex explanations for lots of things that people attribute to the supernatural, such as sickness and poverty. So my question is, what are your thoughts on how one might go about telling a person not to go to a witch doctor or a miracle healing crusade when he's illiterate, uneducated, impoverished, with there being no clinic in sight for 100 kilometers? I ask this because it almost seems like for rationality to flourish, it requires that societies or individuals in those societies uh, be relatively well off first and not so desperate. Well, that's a fascinating question, and you're, you're completely right. Um, particularly the research of Gregory Paul shows exactly what you said, which, which is that conditions of great poverty, lack of welfare, tend to foster religion. And so your question is, and by the way, that shows itself not just in countries of the world. It certainly shows itself there. It also shows itself in states within the United States. If you look at, those, at the states within the United States, the ones that suffer the most poverty and the least social welfare tend to be the most, uh, the most religious. So your question is, what do we do about it? What do we do about it in a poor country, such as Uganda? How do we persuade people to go to a doctor rather than to a witch doctor? I have only one answer, which is, which is to reason with people. Um, I, I have respect for people. I have the feeling that if only people were exposed to the evidence, the evidence that uh, modern medicine works and witch doctors don't work, that evidence is very powerful. And I suspect that if only we could get the evidence to people and and talk to them about it, that they will realize that it's actually true. I can't offer any better solution than that. I'd be interested to know whether you can think of anything. Actually, Haroon Mogul on, on Google Plus has a follow-up question to that. Uh, go ahead, Haroon. 
Well, I, I guess my question is on how we define irrationality. I find the idea that religion correlates with lack of education a bit condescending. Uh, I mean, in the United States, we have a very wealthy society, and you pick up any newspaper, people are obsessed with astrology, uh, they're obsessed with magic, they're obsessed with fantasy. Uh, these are constants in human behavior. I don't think they have anything to do, per se, uh, with uh, exclusive socioeconomic indicators, and, and I think that's really important to clarify. Well, no, I mean, the evidence is contrary to what you suggest. The, the evidence is that even within the United States, as I've just said, uh, those states that have the most poverty and the least social welfare are the states that have the highest religiosity. And I think I it's a council of despair when you say that there's nothing we can do about irrationality. Uh, if you look at the Scandinavian countries, like Sweden, Denmark, uh, Norway, if you look at Holland, if you look at England, um, you'll find that the level of religiosity are hugely lower than in the United States and in the Islamic world. So I think there is hope, and I'm pressing for us to, to move on this front. Professor Dawkins, is there anything good about religion? There are, there's plenty of good things about individual religious people. Plenty of good people have been religious. Albert Schweitzer, Martin Luther King, and so on. Um, but I don't think that religion itself predisposes to goodness. I think that religion predisposes it to uh, blind faith, to faith in something other than what is supported by evidence. And that's a dangerous thing. It can lead to goodness, but it also can lead to terrible evil, like suicide bombers who believe passionately and sincerely that they're righteous and good when they, I don't know, blow up a, a, a building. But doesn't religion also provide a context that without we would be in a, a pretty cold society if we were just living on science and facts alone? I mean, a lot of people look to religion as, as providing a context and emotion and, and morals and principles well, to life. You know, I mean, we, we certainly wouldn't be living in, in, in a cold context with only science and rationality. We'd have art, we'd have music, we'd have literature, uh, we'd have philosophy, uh, we'd have all, we'd have nature, um, we'd have love, human love, we'd have all those things. Those, those wouldn't go. The only thing that would go would be superstitious belief in supernatural things. And since there's no evidence that supernatural things exist or do anything or ever have done anything, wouldn't we be better off without them? We could keep all the rest. We could keep music, art, philosophy, and science. Well, would we be better off without them? I guess that is the question that we're posing to our community members. Um, of course, if you have thoughts on that, tweet us using the hashtag AJStream. But Professor, I want to go back to something you said a little bit earlier. You said reason with people. We should try to reason with people and use the word uh, hope. We put this this question out uh, to our community on reddit.com, on the atheism thread, actually. Um, there's a comment here. Uh, someone responded to that, and I'll pull it up on my screen. Hopefully, you can see it. Uh, ben9345, I'll also read it out for you. Ben says, should an atheist try purposefully to deconvert people? And if so, how can one square this with the common criticism of Christians that they force their religion on others? W what is the purpose of your book? Uh, you know, is it to just a elucidate things or is it to deconvert people as as he suggests no no I, w I want i want to encourage people to think for them for themselves i don't want to say you sh you must believe x that's what religious indoctrination does i never say that what i want to say is think it out for yourself here's the evidence here's the reasoning process here's the logical process think it out for, it for yourself and i believe that if you do that if you look at the evidence and think logically about it, you will come to the atheistic conclusion. But I'm not going to indoctrinate anybody in atheism. Far from it. What is your children's book doing then? My children's book is all about science. There's very little atheism in it. And I think there's no atheism in it. Um, it is about science, uh, and it is an attempt to show that the reality, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the reality of science is not only true, but it's also thrilling and exciting and far more exciting, far more thrilling, far more aesthetically exciting than any myth, including biblical or Quranic myths. Well, let's go straight back to Google Plus because I know uh, there's lots of questions waiting to be asked there. Um, let's go to Jesse. Jesse, go ahead. And Jesse, of course, is speaking to us from Berkeley, California. Yeah. Hi, with the uh, National Secular Student Alliance. Uh, criticizing religion for indoctrinating children is something I've heard you do a lot. And uh, the students on campus with Second Student Alliances often wrestle with the idea of what tactics are acceptable for spreading atheism. We want to make sure we're respecting people's intellect, but also using effective tools. 
what do you think is uh, appropriate and inappropriate ways to spread atheism? Well, as I've just said, I think the appropriate way is to encourage people to think critically, think for themselves, examine the evidence, and apply logical methods to it. An inappropriate method would be indoctrination, would be bossy, hectoring, would be telling people what they must believe. Never tell anybody what they must believe. Tell them how to think, how to think critically, how to work it out for themselves. A few more views from Twitter on that. Shahri tweets in, atheism is a denial of exist existence. It believes in nothing, so it has no dogma. It is rather anti-dogmatic. And one more from Stuart who says, atheism can be just as narrow-minded as religion because anything that can't be explained through science is seen as wrong. Um, let's ponder those over. And in, in the meantime, let's go back to Google Plus where Maryam Namazi is waiting to uh, speak her mind. Go ahead, Maryam. Hello, um, uh, thank you for having us on the program. It's a really interesting program. I, I think I agree with uh, uh, Professor Dawkins. Uh, one of the problems though with um, you know, uh, people having access to rationality and science and so on and so forth is that very often religion is opposed to it. And when it comes to uh, people having access to information and free expression, particularly in this day and age with regards to Islam, we find that any sort of criticism and dissent is deemed to be Islamophobic, racist, and I often compare this to a form of secular fatwa in the West where it's used to silence criticism and dissent and rational thinking. And, uh, you know, I, I'd like to ask Professor Dawkins how he goes around this issue because it is one that a lot of those of us who are atheists, ex-Muslims, um, who come from, um, you know, various countries in the Middle East and North Africa are faced with here in the West when we try to discuss rationality, science, and atheism. Well, it's a great pleasure to talk to Mariam Namazi, who's a great hero of mine. And Mariam, you're, of course, totally right that there are active forces of oppression which are oppressing people in the name of religion, especially oppressing women. Uh, and you are one of the main people fighting against that, especially in England, but in the Islamic world generally. Um, this, I think, is, is wicked. Uh, I think that a religion that finds it necessary to use force, to use the threat of force, which they do, um, can't really have very much confidence in how right it is, because if it were really right, then the rightness should shine forth without the need for threats, without the need for force, without the need for threatening to kill people or, or stone them or, or whatever it is. So I find, I find it very hard to have any respect for a religion that has so little confidence in the truth of its beliefs that it feels reduced to using threats in order to propagate those beliefs. And I salute you, Mariam, in your fight against this. Uh, Haroon, I want to go back to you in, in Google Plus and, and get your thoughts on whether you think that these uh, sweeping statements, sweeping generalities, it, it can be dangerous. I mean, we're talking about billions of people worldwide that are people of faith. Yeah, I think they're quite irresponsible and, and they're very dangerous. I mean, for one point, uh, the forms of religion that we've seen in the Muslim world, fundamentalism, the extremism, uh, they're by no means defensible, uh, but they are direct responses to uh, state-enforced secularization uh, and atheism. Uh, you know, in Turkey, in Iran, there were mandated dress codes that pushed society towards secularization, and then there was a push back from religion. Uh, and, and there's been this back and forth in the Muslim world for about 100 years now. Uh, so it's very hard to say that this is a product of religion per se. Uh, it's a product of a very complicated social situation and a very complicated history, and you can't just say this is religion. Uh, that doesn't explain, for example, why in Turkey in the 1920s, if you dressed a certain way, in a religious way, you could be put to death. Uh, so, so these are, you know, far more complicated than religion and science or religion and reason, as if the two are opposite. There's an interesting view why here. They on are complicated. I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Professor. No, no. Go, go ahead. Well, uh, I'd like to just follow up what Haroon said because there's an interesting view here um, from Fatima on Twitter, and she says, retrospectively, religion already existed. There was less hostility and violence in the past, so isn't man the root cause of violence? So if you could respond to that in addition to Haroon's uh, comments. Well, these things are very complicated, and uh, I wouldn't wish to be, um, to be over simple. I think it's rather an extraordinary suggestion that the rise of um, all the wickedness of Islamic fundamentalism is a pushback from 
from secularism. I mean, if you took that to its logical conclusion, we'd all shut up and stop talking any sense for fear of, of provoking other people to talk even worse nonsense than they already do. And I don't think anybody would really want to, uh, to uh, advocate that. I think I would also say that moderate, sort of decent religion, harmless religion, religion that doesn't threaten anybody, uh, does in a way make the world safe for extremism because moderate religion does teach children that faith is a virtue. And if children are taught in madrasas or Sunday schools that faith is a virtue, that it's a virtue to believe things without evidence and without reason, then a minority of people who are taught that are going to get into, into their heads that their faith requires them to, say, become martyrs. And that wouldn't happen if children were not taught that faith, blind faith, faith without evidence, believing things without evidence, that this is a virtue. Once you teach children that that's a virtue, and most children will accept that in a, in a moderate way and will grow up to be perfectly decent, nice citizens, but a minority will take it really seriously. A minority will really follow through their beliefs to their logical conclusion. And we don't want people following through their beliefs to their logical conclusion, because that way violence lies. Professor Dawkins, let's take that one step further in terms of children and education. W what are your views on how children should or should not be educated in the public school system? Once again, children like adults, like anybody else, should be taught how to think critically, should be taught to question, should be taught to seek evidence, to, to, to be taught to ask, is that plausible? Is that likely? What's the evidence for it? A child should never say, oh, an adult told me X, therefore X must be true. The child should say, wait a minute, what's the evidence for that? Or is that the kind of thing that we probably know because of evidence? Or is that the kind of thing that we only think we know because it's been handed down by tradition or in a holy book? Because if it's tradition or a holy book or revelation, then we have no reason whatever to accept that it's true. What the child should be taught to, to ask is, what's the evidence? Why does it follow? Is it plausible? Okay, I want to pick up on this discussion, uh, Professor, in our post show, which is going to occur online in just a couple of seconds. Everybody in the Google Hangout, sit tight. But first, we want to go to, uh, to Malika. She's got a few other leads that we're following today. Our first lead is out of Algeria, where blogger Tarek Bahmadi has been sentenced to eight months in prison. An Algerian court charged Mamadi, seen here, with damaging property and stirring up protests ahead of the May legislative elections. The 23-year-old activist was originally detained for calling on voters to boycott the elections. Yes, I destroyed electoral placards and burned my voters' card. I opted to do that rather than immolate myself, Mamadi is quoted to have said. And out of Bahrain, human rights activist Nabil Rajab has been released from jail three weeks after his last arrest. Welcome back among us. Nabil Rajab fights dictatorship every day with a smile on his face, tweets Angry Arabia. Rajab, who appeared on the stream shortly before his detention, had been accused of posting tweets deemed insulting to the government. He told the stream then that he would continue his work regardless of the charges against him. You can see more about these stories on our website at stream.aljazeera.com. Check them out and tweet us your thoughts at hashtag AJStream. Lisa? And stay with us because the post show is next at stream.aljazeera.com. We're talking with Professor Richard Dawkins, one of the most renowned evolutionists in the world. We're talking about whether or not God and religion can coexist. Keep tweeting your thoughts. Go to online access right now and watch the post show. And uh, we're going to be on again tomorrow on TV, and our subject is going to be the growing Sudan revolts. We're wondering about the protests. They began as new austerity measures, and now they look like they could be turning into an all-out revolt. Send us your thoughts on that, and follow us on Twitter for some live updates. And until then, we'll see you online. Welcome back. You're watching the post show at stream.aljazeera.com. We're going to continue our discussion with Professor Richard Dawkins and our 
our gang in the Google Hangout. Professor Dawkins, we were talking about how children should and shouldn't be educated when it comes to science and when it comes to religion. And you had said, you know, they should be taught the evidence. They should be taught to critically think. But isn't it wise to consider the possibility of things that we do not know and limit education to what we only know as fact and then leave open the possibility for things that we do not know? We should certainly open our minds to things that we don't yet know. There's plenty that we don't yet know. And the way we're going to find out what we don't yet know is the methods of science. Because we, we readily admit that there are many things that we don't yet know, what is an utter falsehood is to say, because we don't yet know the answer, therefore religion does. I mean, that's totally illogical. There are plenty of things we don't know, but if science doesn't know it, religion doesn't know it either. There's absolutely no reason to think that just because science doesn't know something, some prophet a thousand years, two thousand years, three thousand years ago, therefore does know it. They had much less opportunity to know anything than we do today. True, but we, we can't forget that science has been and will again in the future be wrong. Of course, science will be wrong and science will be proved wrong by better science. Much of science we know to be right, some of science will probably be proved to be wrong, but it will be better science that proves it to be wrong. It most certainly will not be religion or superstition. Well, isn't the base of that human consciousness, though? I mean, th that's what will prove any of these things to be wrong. It's, it's human's intellect. Of course, human intellect deployed through proper channels. Well, you're making a lot of people uh, heated here on Twitter, Professor. Hen Mackey writes, Richard Dawkins on AJ Stream, many religious people believe in evolution. Yep, I'm one of those people. And Jamal asks, has a professor studied all religions? Islam accepts science while others do not. The professor lives on logic while it's clear uh, the human brain. He doesn't quite finish that sentence there. Um, but I'd like to go back to Google Plus uh, because Miriam is waiting there with a comment. Well, I, I wanted to... Uh uh, ask um, Professor Dawkins' opinion on uh, the best form of society that can help to safeguard both people's right to religion and also science. I mean, I think it is a secular society, but a strict secular society, one in which religion is a private matter uh, and it's kept out of the state, the educational system and the judicial system. And I think it safeguards both the religious and uh, those who are atheists. And it also allows science to flourish. W would you agree with that? I would agree with that very strongly, and it's very important to understand that secular does not mean atheistic. There are plenty of, di of strong secularists who are religious, whether they're Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, whatever it is. So we want secularism, we want, we want religion to be permitted to flourish, but not to impose itself on others, on children, on anybody else. It should be a private matter uh, and um, should not be something that is imposed from outside on people. Secularism means that. Secularism does not mean atheism. And a secular society is one that we should be striving for, as Gandhi suggested, as Nehru suggested, uh, as the founders of the American Revolution suggested, as all the great political thinkers have suggested through the centuries. Professor Dawkins, with regard to the numbers of religious people around the world, billions of people, would you say that those people are gullible and naive? No, I would say in most cases, well, it, let, let's single out uh, people who believe that the world is young, that the world is le less than 10,000 years old. Um, they are ignorant. I'm not saying they're gullible or naive or stupid. They are ignorant. And it's my job as a scientist and job of other scientists to dispel that ignorance and do something about it. Um, it's no crime to be ignorant. We're all ignorant of plenty of things. But this is a rather important thing to be ignorant of. And if you're ignorant of something, you should not lay down the law about it. I'm extremely ignorant of baseball, but I don't go around preaching my ignorance of baseball. I say, well, I don't know about that. Don't ask me about that. It's not my subject. People who don't know about life, who don't know about biology, don't know about history, should not go around saying evolution is false because they don't know what they're talking about. They should keep quiet and talk about what they do know what, they, what they're talking about. Nobody in our community is keeping quiet today. <laughs> Not at all. Um, let's go straight to a video comment from one member of our community. Professor, have a listen to this. It's on morality. Hello, Professor Dawkins. My name is Ngazi Arandu, and I am in London. In your essay, Man Sorry, this Sorry I can't that hear. Seems it, to there's be just too much yes, background noise. I the audio hear a word and that, that seems to be a bit uh, uh, overmodulated. Let's, let's yes. try that one more time. 
Hello, Professor Dawkins. My name is Ngazi Arandu, and I am in London, England. In your essay, Man vs. God, you ask, what is so special about life? And then you liken humanity to matter. If life isn't sacred, then why is murder bad? Why is child molestation, theft, lying? Why do we all generally in most cultures consider them wrong? Where do we get the notion of morality? From physics or from I God? Believe, I, cannot, I cannot believe you're suggesting that if you didn't believe in God, you would think it was okay to go out and murder people. Do you seriously think that we need religion in order to agree that murder is a bad thing? Do you seriously think that before, I don't know, Moses came down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments and, and said, thou shalt not kill, the, the people said, oh, right, thou shalt not kill. Oh, how surprising, we didn't know that before. Right, in future, we won't kill. Of course, that's not how it happened. We have perfectly good reasons for saying we don't like to live in the sort of society where people kill each other at will. And if they do it, we lock them up and we think in any case that it's a bad thing. And there's absolutely no evidence that atheists are any less moral than religious people. Well, Professor, just to defend her, since she couldn't be here in the studio, she left that video comment for us. I, I think what her question might have been asking is, if that doesn't come from religion, you as a scientist, can you explain where that does come from? I think in, especially in terms of where conscience comes from. It's not something you can physiologically yeah. put your finger on. Well, not physiologically perhaps, but it's certainly true that it comes from the, from the brain. And it's very, there are very good evolutionary reasons why we should shrink from being cruel, from being unkind. One can make a very good case for that. But I want to come back to the point, I cannot believe that any person in good conscience would ever say the only reason that, I, that I'm good, the only reason I'm a good person is my religion. If, if you believe that, you're actually admitting that if you thought God wasn't, wasn't watching you, say, you'd go out and kill somebody. I mean, I don't want to know that kind of person. I want to know the kind of person who is good for the sake of being good, not being good for the sake of sucking up to God. Uh, Professor, if, if evolution weeds out the weak and weeds out the bad elements of, of society as a whole, if Darwinism is accurate and if um, the selfish gene version of Darwinism that, that you wrote your book on is correct, explain to me why then we haven't self-selected for atheism if that's, if that's the way to go. Why don't we have a planet that's populated with atheists? There's no particular reason why natural selection should favor atheists. And there are, one can come up with very good reasons why natural selection might have favored superstition. Um, under, in the primitive conditions in which our ancestors lived, there are, it, it, it's a complicated argument, but it's an argument that's been made in, there are many books about it. For example, there's a, a good reasons to impute agency to things. If you see something happening in the world, uh, I've used the example before of the rustling in the long grass. If our ancestors saw the long grass, say in, in Africa, rustling, it could be a leopard or it could be the wind. Now, um, there are good survival reasons to make the assumption that it's probably a leopard. Even though it probably isn't a leopard, it's safer to assume that it is. Generalizing that point, it's good survival strategy to assume agency rather than blind forces of physics. So if you are predisposed to assume agency, then you tend to assume agency in all sorts of things, in thunder, in lightning, in rivers, in waves. And that leads to primitive religion. So one can make a very good historical, evolutionary, anthropological case for why uh, religions develop. Let's go straight to Google Plus because I know they're waiting to ask questions. James has a question. Go ahead, James. <coughs> Yeah, uh, Professor Dawkins, my second question is an internal question. It has to do with the atheist community, um, particularly the one that's online. Voltaire famously said that if God does not exist, then it would be necessary to invent him. When I look at some of what's going on in certain corners of the atheist community today, I'm uh, reminded of Voltaire's words. While they might not believe in any gods, many atheists do seem to have their fair share of sacred cows, and in defense of those sacred cows, they will often appeal to the same logical fallacies that you might hear a religious person appealing to in defense of their... James, we've got 30 seconds left in the program. You're going to have to okay, get to your question. So, um, that right, so my question, uh, Professor Dawkins, is, uh, so when you see this happening among a community of people that pride themselves as being rational, how does that make you feel, and what do you think is the way 
Uh, Professor Dawkins, you are going to have to tweet the answer to that que uh, uh, question, unfortunately. Okay. We are out of time. Uh, I'd, I'd be fascinated to know what he's thinking of in, that, in, in sacred cows in the atheist community. But um, sorry, there's no time. Professor Richard Dawkins joining us from London. Thank you so much for your time today. To our guests in Google thank Hangout, you. thank pleasure. you for your thoughts and your questions and very interesting conversation. We'll see you tomorrow online. Have a great day.